the third session of the 2024 Ohio State University Extension Beef Team's Virtual Beef School was hosted via Zoom on March 21st. This year's four evening beef school sessions are taking a deep dive into production practices and factors that impact quality and profitability when it comes to producing beef to be marketed directly to consumers. This third beef school session featured OSU Extension Meat Specialist Lida Garcia and focused on adding value to beef carcasses, improving carcass yield, and utilizing cows and bulls in the supply chain. This third beef school session begins as Extension Beef Field Specialist Garth Ruff introduces Dr. Garcia. I just kind of to recap things, uh, we started with genetics and reproduction, you know, how genetics impacts beef quality. We talked last month about nutrition and how we can tweak nutrition uh, to meet our needs. Um, going to dive into some meat science topics here this evening. Um, I give Lida a whole list of things. Kind of interested to see how she pieced that puzzle together um, to talk about some of the questions that uh, come through my email box. I'm sure she gets them as well uh, or some stuff that maybe Stan's thought up over the years. But uh, we're going to dive into the meat science here this evening and we'll finish uh, April 18th uh, with our panel. We got uh, three producers that work in this direct marketing business and then of course Dale Phillips uh, kind of representing the meat processing side of things. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Lida. I think she got some introduction slides, so I'll uh, let you introduce yourself. Um, if you got questions, as always, Q and A box, chat box. We'll try to watch that through throughout the presentation. So, Lida, I'm going to turn this over to you. Perfect. Well, I appreciate it, Garth. And um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my slides here. Uh, I hope everyone's doing doing well this evening, six o'clock. It is nice and sunny out there. Um, but uh, you know, what I'm gonna do is is uh, try to share a little fundamental uh, information around meat science and its impact on beef products. And so for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm originally from Texas, all my schooling's in Texas. Um, you know, I've been here at Ohio State for about nine years now, nine and a half years. Sometimes it feels like I just got here. Sometimes it feels that I've been here longer than nine and a half years. But I'll tell you the best thing I ever did was leave home, get out of my comfort zone and uh, learn something new. And, and you know, and um, so I've been very blessed to be here at Ohio uh, for, for that long. So what do I do here at Ohio State? Well, I do have a 50% uh, teaching appointment where I primarily focus on undergraduate students. Um, but I also have a 50% extension appointment um, in outreach. Uh, I am one of two extension meat specialists for the state of Ohio. So my job is to help uh, problem solve, help producers if they have any uh, meat science, meat related questions along with uh, processors. Um, usually if there is a, a challenge or a problem and I can turn it into an undergraduate research project or maybe even a master's project, right, to help connect the dots for our students um, in taking that lecture material into real world application, I will do the best I can to make that into a research project because in my mind, it's a win-win situation. So um, let's see. So just a quick background, you know, when, when, I, when I spoke to Garth about um, this, my topic at least, you know, there's just so much to tell. There's so much information and always never enough time for me to share um, everything I want to share with people because I want you guys to be well um, informed. I want you to be knowledgeable because sometimes we won't always be there um, when you have questions or needs and so forth. So in talking to Garth, he did, um, he did share some, some common questions and I thought, well, rather than just give you the answer, I, I thought maybe I'd approach it in a way where I'd give you a background. I give you some foundational information in hopes that when you do have questions, you, you're able to, to work through it, um, and, you know, to get to that, to that answer. So at least when it comes to meat science, for those who aren't very familiar with, with this world, meat science uh, programs can be found in either animal science departments, food science departments, or even a combination, right? Um, it just depends on the university. But as meat scientists, we need to have a good foundation with a lot of the backgrounding of the animals. And what does that mean? That means more of we have to under, understand the species. 
understand the sex, the impacts of age on the animals and, and its meat products. Uh, we have to understand feeding and nutrition. Now, let me make it clear. We're not nutritionists. We know just enough to get in trouble. Not really. We know a little bit more than that. But uh, we also have to understand what the livestock industry is doing because it's also about supply and demand. Uh, animal handling and behavior. That is, um, as you know, it's a, it's, it's a hot topic. Genetics, very important. And, um, you know, this webinar has already done a great job in having people speak about uh, some of these topics, because at the end of the day, uh, it's about the quality and the safety of that meat product. Um, and, and a disadvantage that we have, at least in the meat world, is once we receive that animal and it's now hanging um, on a rail, if there is something wrong with it, we can't send it back to the producer or to the farmer. We have to figure out what we're going to do with it. And so in order to assure the, the quality and the safety of these products, um, understanding the meat science and the management practices and how they have an impact on the end product matters. So um, these are some basic questions that that Garth shared with me that, you know, got me to thinking about how I wanted to tailor my or this presentation um, and so in hopes that at the end of this presentation, we can still go back and talk about adding value, uh, improving carcass yields, and, you know, should we utilize cows and bulls when we're talking about selling uh, beef products? And so just to get started, one thing that we need to keep in mind is that meat, um, muscle is, is found in the live animal. Meat is when rigor mortis has occurred, and now we've got uh, meat on our plate, right? Meat for consumption. And there is a difference with these two, especially when we're talking about the biochemistry, but you got to take my class to understand that just a little bit more. For the sake of today, I'm just going to, I'm going to skip through it. But if we talk about just muscle composition, what are we dealing with? Well, muscle composition consists of 75% water. Um, I'm sure many of us have heard our doctor say we need to drink more water. Well, it's true because um, we're mammals just like these food animals and our muscles consist of 75% water. We are looking on average at about 18% protein. Uh, fat can range between three and five. Again, it's, you know, there are some, some, some factors we need to consider, but uh, we do have about 1% of vitamins and minerals and carbohydrates. So, some of you may have seen this slide before, some of you may not, but one thing that I do wanna talk about is muscle pH. Muscle pH has a lot to do with that end product, right? That quality of it. Um, we may have seen, a lot of us have seen beef, uh, you know, exhibiting more of a nice cherry red color, which is something very ideal. And some of us may have seen beef cuts looking very dark as we see up on top. Uh, at least when it comes to pork, um, we may have seen some nice reddish pink pork cuts, and we may have seen probably some pale, pale colored chops um, that has a very soft texture and maybe water is leaching out. I'm going to talk about what causes this because this is a very common question that I get from a, from producers, even from grocery stores when and here in Ohio, when uh, they they do receive product box beef looking a very similar to what we're seeing. But the one thing that I that I do need to um, emphasize here is when it comes to muscle pH, we need to understand that stress is a big factor. Now, but I also want to clarify that stress does not always pertain to mishandling. Okay, so there are three categories that we need to take into account. There's a psychological stress, a physical stress, and then a nutritional stress. How many of us know people who stress on a turn of a dime, who stress when you turn the light switch on, right? Everything else can be calm in the environment, but you turn, something changes in the environment and now we have people stressing. Well, that, these animals are no different. You can do the best you can to keep them calm um, and in, in all that we do, but sometimes biology, right? Sometimes naturally the animal is just gonna stress on its own. That's what we call psychological stress. The other thing is, um, you know, when we talk about holdover cattle, especially cattle that are in pens, um, and, and I'm referring more to uh, the large scale packers, when they drop off cattle past uh, three o'clock and now these cattle are, are gonna stay in the pens over the weekend, right? That's what, what they call holdover cattle. 
and they'll be the first ones to go Monday morning. Well, sometimes when the weather changes, you get the cold front coming in, or maybe there was a hailstorm or something came up. That's also part of a psychological stress. That's That can and will have an impact on that muscle quality because of the muscle pH. Then, of course, we have the physical stress. This is something that a lot of us know about, about people mishandling or roughhousing or um, rushing them, right, where they're excited. The animals are now running off a trailer or load or running into the trailer to load up or, or unload. That can cause, um, that will impact the muscle pH. But then we can't forget that sometimes, you know, we can do the best we can and these animals are just going to fight. That's just a natural occurrence. Uh, mounting others, right? Physical stress. And then the last one is nutritional. You guys have, you all should have already heard the um, webinar about the importance of nutrition, understanding that we have to have the right balance for these animals to um, to maintain homeostasis, right? To make sure that they're healthy. If they're, if they're lacking something, that body will, will undergo stress. And that can also have an impact. So the moral of the story here is that when we do see quality defects, and again, and I'm going to go through it briefly on how it, it how um, muscle converts to meat, um, we need to make sure that we take more than just the physiological stress into account. Once again, there are a lot of great livestock producers here in the United States who do a tremendous job, who go through all the beef quality assurance programs. They learn about all the education and they are to be commended for doing a great job. But sometimes things happen that, that's just out of our control. And that's where these other stressors can come in. So I just wanted just to, to make sure that, that we're clear that it's anytime that we have a quality defect, we shouldn't always turn to just the physiological stress. There could be other, other factors. So um, this, this figure here, I don't want it um, to look too intimidating or anything, but what we need to understand is that Bovine have over 600 muscles, individual muscles, independent muscles that all work independently. On average, each muscle holds about 1% glycogen. And as you know, glycogen is a type of sugar that we use as for energy. The moral or the point to this figure is if we start out with 1%, what that animal goes through right before uh, slaughter, before harvest, will determine the amount of lactic acid produced when it's it's starting to convert from muscle to meat right for before rigor mortis occurs so in other words if all conditions are normal and the animal's not stressed now the animal has been harvested and um, now we're starting to see you know the conversion of muscle to meat all this biochemistry is happening the right amount of lactic acid is going to be produced as a byproduct. That's a good thing because the average pH of muscle in living muscle is 7.3, which is neutral. What we want is for that pH to drop to five, between a 5.6 and a 5.8. And why there's a range of 5.6 and 5.8 is because it's species dependent. But for the sake of just education and information, we will say between a 5.6 and a 5.8. We need the right amount of lactic acid for that muscle pH to drop between a 5.6 and a 5.8. But here's the kicker. If the animal stresses for long periods of time, utilizing that glycogen as an energy source, the animal will not have enough glycogen at harvest, at slaughter. So if we don't have enough glycogen to start out with, we're not going to have enough lactic acid produced which then means we're not that the muscle pH is not going to deviate very far from neutral. That's a problem. Or on, on, on the other hand, if an animal stresses too fast, meaning minutes before slaughter and body temperatures rise. So think about if we asked, you know, how many times we, we got stressed when we were, we had to give a presentation and we hope to God we put deodorant on right that day thinking that we remembered do you remember how how um, how some of us were we sweat? It's the same concept with with uh, with some of these animals. Their body temperature increases. They're burning through that glycogen really fast, which is then producing too much lactic acid. So now think about what acid does just in nature. It's going to denature. So too much is going to burn through a lot of proteins. And so, what in the world am I referring to? Well, this is where this is the. Um, the slide that I was just talking about, you'll notice that in the middle picture there of that nice ribeye, that's a uh, nice cherry red, that that falls under the normal 
uh, pH range of 5.6 and 5.8. The one up on top is a quality defect, the dark one. Some of us may have seen this. This is caused by long-term stress. Now, how do we quantify long-term? We well, usually it's hours or days before slaughter. And that animal didn't have enough time or it didn't replenish what it lost. So it didn't have, when at, at slaughter, it didn't start out with an, a, a lot of glycogen. Remember, not enough glycogen will produce not enough lactic acid, which then will, will result in that pH not deviating very far from neutral. Hence why now you see um, the ribeye dark in color, it's firm to the touch, and the surface area is dry. Um, and this is a potential food safety concern because if you think about the type of bacteria that are associated with meat products, uh, these are these bacteria are known as psychotroph bacteria like your E. coli, salmonella, and so forth. They really like an environment that's moist and a pH closer to neutral. And what we've just done here is now we've presented an ideal environment for bacteria if if it's if they're present to replicate. Hence why you often see these types of products have a shorter shelf life than your normal ranged uh, pH muscle, if that makes sense. So if the top one, if, if dark, firm, and dry is due to long-term stress, then the one at the bottom is what we refer to as short, caused by short-term stress. This is known as pale, soft, and exudative, PSE for short. This is common, more common in pork and in poultry. Whereas DFD is more common in um, beef and lamb, but that doesn't mean that the other species can't can't uh, result in that other defect. It's just it's more commonly found in uh, pork and poultry, and then of course your your red meats. So what happens here, at least with a PSC, is that the animals will stress rapidly, fast, minutes, and again, again, in addition the body temperatures are on the rise. So now you've got heat with an abundance amount of lactic acid. You'll notice how the pH significantly drops the first three hours. So think about just pouring this lactic acid just on, on something and then everything just denaturing. That's what's happening. And in the picture, you'll you'll notice on in that on that loin eye, that pork or that chop, you see a puddle of water. What's happening is that that lactic acid denatured the proteins that were holding onto the water and then also denatured myoglobin, which is the globular protein responsible for giving meat its red color. It's also leaching with the water. That makes sense. So, um, and usually the products that are that do result in PSE are tougher, they're drier. Um, sometimes our industry will just grind these uh, this type of product and then add back some protein like a non-fat powder, dried milk or soy or something, depending on the product. Because, um, and also adding back some moisture, right? Because that's what it's losing a lot of. This is just a, an example of, of just what uh, the impact of PSC has. You'll notice in how much water is lost with each one. Now, when it comes to normal pH, understand that it is normal for muscle, for meat to release water. It's called free water or purge water. That is normal. What we don't want is for more of that water, more than what is already released, um, we don't want more of that because now we start changing the um, the water hold or the water holding capacity, which then is going to impact the quality of this product. So the other thing that I that I'd like to touch on is dressing percentage. Um, at, at least, at least in in my experiences, I've 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 heard you know some some misunderstandings about dressing percentage and yield. Well, uh, just a, a brief brief overview of this. We need to understand that the dressing percentage, what it means, and that's truly a percent of the live animal um, weight that becomes a carcass weight. So we always want to strive for a higher percentage in beef, especially fed beef, you know, that can range between a 60 and 65%. Right now, our large scale industry is at 64%, uh, which is used to be 63%. But understand that this is dependent as well, because we're not going to get, it's not common to see, to find cull cows result in a 65%. We're usually going to do mid fifties, high fifties, possibly 60%. But we have to understand the species to know that there will be differences. And, and work with your processor because a lot of our processors understand this and they can tell you what's good and what's and what's um, probably needs to be worked on. If you want to calculate your dressing percentage, 
it's very critical that you start with a live weight. And um, but it's nothing more than taking the hot carcass weight right right before it chills, taking the hot carcass weight, which your processor will have and divide it by the live weight and then multiply it by 100. Very simple. But now what affects dressing percentage? Well, the amount of back fat matters, right? Um, the amount of muscling matters because now we have weight that's um, a combination of, of muscle, fat, internal organs, um, hide, right? Head, feet, things like this. But at least when it comes to the carcass, the amount of fat, the amount of muscle and bone can play a role. You know, we've, and at least not here in Ohio, but at least when I was in Texas, we had to account for native cattle, Brahmin cattle and dairy cattle, and they contribute a different percentage of bone um, as, as you can imagine. The other thing is, is how is fill? How full is that? How full is the digestive tract? You know, if you send the animals full on feed or on water, that live weight's gonna be heavy. But then now you remove all your viscera, you remove everything on the inside, and now your hot carcass weight is a bit lighter than what you wanted, and now your dressing percentage is lower, and we're not happy. We have to understand that that live weight can, will, I mean, it, uh, too many factors will impact that live weight. And if we try to avoid sending them full on feed and full on water, that could be very beneficial to your dressing percentage. The other thing we need to keep in mind though, is if we send cattle or any animal full on feed to the processor, we run the risk of our of their employees, what we, what we call um, busting a gut, right? Meaning poking a hole in that digestive tract. And now we've got all the content spewing on the carcasses. Now we've got a food safety concern. And now most likely, our processor is going to have to trim all that. And when we trim, we're losing weight, which means we're losing money. Okay. So we, these, these are things we need to think about. Um, method of dressing, you know, what are the dress off items? But then we also have workman skills. This is probably something that I've, I've had to deal with the last three or four years and, and um, is just trying to help train some of the employees of just the basics of cutting um, because not everybody has that background, knows how to use a knife, you know, but, um, but, at least understand that when it comes to dressing percentage, there, there are so many confounding factors at play. It's not just one answer. So many things to account for, to consider. Um, when we talk about age, and here I'm referring to more like a cold cow versus a young, a young beef animal. Understand that as the animals age physiologically and chronologically, okay, um, know that the connective tissue will thicken. So, the animal will naturally become tougher. And the way that I want you to picture this is if I if I use my tumbler here, I want you to picture this tumbler as whole muscle. The shininess that you see here, I want you to see this as um, a membrane or a cover that consists of connective tissue and fat, a combination. If I placed straws in this tumbler, those straws would be referred to as muscle bundles. The straws are also enwrapped with a membrane of connective tissue and fat. If I place toothpicks in the straws, they too are also known as muscle fibers, but they too are, have, are surrounded by fat and connective tissue. Why do I say this? Is because you have to understand that connect, connective tissue just isn't around the muscle or between, or seam fat between the muscles, right? There are various layers of connective tissue and fat. So if the, when the, as the animal gets older, all that connective tissue thickens, they don't acquire more cross linkages, the connective tissue will thicken. Hence why a cold cow will naturally be um, more tough, right? Tougher than a young fed animal. So if we know this, when it comes to cooking, we need to know that connective tissue starts to break down at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, but completely breaks down at 200. Hence why when we're talking about a brisket, many of our of our, our barbecue um, experts or fans or however you want to refer to it, will cook a brisket and, and a pork shoulder up to 200 degrees, 205. They may even go up to 210. But the point here is, is that we need to break down some of that connective tissue. I just wanna give you an idea of what it looks like because as the animal gets older, they acquire more connective tissue. Now, this was a, the, this picture is from a cold cow study that we just did 
this past summer, we were comparing boner cows to leaner cows, basically looking at body condition scores of fives and sixes um, compared to your, your leaner, right? Um, ones, twos, and threes. What we found was that with the ones, twos, and threes and age, this is what we had to deal with here. That's a lot of connective tissue that was, that was contributing to weight. It was, it was very messy. Um, it was, it, it had a very, a very, um, distinct odor. Uh, but this also came from roughly in about, um, uh, at least when it comes to ossification, it was a, what we consider an e-bone, which is uh, 96 months of age or older. So I just wanted to give you an idea of of what you what a cold cow could possibly let me make it clear could possibly bring to the table. Again, this is also age dependent. Another thing, you know, when at least when it comes to adding value, this is where I, I was thinking, you know, like what's realistic here? What can I share with with my audience that's realistic, especially if you're using a local processor? Well, aging can be uh, something that we can consider. Now, why is aging important? <clears throat> why do people want longer hang times? And I understand that sometimes hang times aren't aren't doable beyond seven days, ten days, maybe two weeks. But there are some options here. What's happening here is that there are some, some natural occurring proteolytic enzymes that are found in the meat and the muscle itself. There are two types. There's one known as calpanes and there's one known as calpostatins. It's the calpanes that we rely on to help tenderize the meat, meaning we rely on to make the meat a little bit more tender. Now, it, the longer we hang it doesn't necessarily mean that these calpanes are always working. They have a stop time. And so, but like with every green light, we have a red light. We also have some enzymes known as calpostatins that inhibit the calpanes. So the big question is, is well, when when do we know we have more calpanes versus calpostatins? Well, it's breed dependent. These hump cattle here, these zebu type cattle, Brahmin cattle, they naturally have a higher level or they have more calpostatins. They are naturally going to be tougher. And our industry knows this. Any carcass exhibiting a hump greater than four inches in width from the backbone is, is automatically given a discount simply because that carcass is exhibiting more zebu type characteristics, which means the industry or the beef facility knows that carcass has more calpostatins and is naturally going to be tougher, if that makes any sense. Now, we don't worry about this too much in Ohio, but I just wanted to make sure that you understood, whereas the Angus cattle are going to have less calpostatins and more calpanes, which works in your favor. Not just Angus. I'm talking about native cattle. So anybody outside of the, the Brahmin, Zebu, you're okay. Okay. So now when it comes to postmortem aging, this is storage time. Again, it's the calpanes that will denature the muscle structure, which increases tenderness. Now, these calpanes will only work up to a certain amount of time. So in when it comes to beef, it's usually, and, and there are studies ranging that, that state, it, it ranges from 10 days to 14 days. Hence why you hear people say, well, I want my beef to hang for two weeks. Okay. Yeah, well, it's because the calpanes stop working after after 10 to 14 days. It, again, studies have shown there's a, there's a, a range. But what happens if we let them hang longer than, let's just say, 14 days? Well, it's still okay because what we're doing now is intensifying the flavor. And that's another component that customers like. Swine or pork carcasses, usually, you know, the studies have said about eight to 10 days, lamb seven days. But you know that if we leave the lambs hanging longer than maybe even five days, it starts to get really tough or dry, sorry, really dry. If we're talking about pork and um, we have the skin on, you know, that skin's going to be extremely tough, extremely hard. So at least here in our meat lab, we try really hard not to let our pork carcasses hang longer than five days. Uh, but, well, but we leave the skin on here um, and lambs, we try not to keep them longer than three or four days. But again, we're also uh, an educational institution. So we, I use them up a lot now, but Understand though that there are two different types of aging. What I just described to you was was a hang time, right? What would be considered dry aging. But know that dry aging technically means that we are 
impacting, we're affecting the percent humidity and percent, I mean, I'm sorry, percent humidity and temperature. So the rule of thumb is if we really wanted to dry age and create a mold, because that's part of it, we would have a minimum percentage of 65% humidity with about 36 degree Fahrenheit. We also need fans to disperse the humidity and the temperature. And usually what um, it's measured in feet, like how far will that, will that fan send that air, right, to help circulate? And it's usually about, you know, uh, 10 to 12 feet or, but that's for another day. That is, that is a true definition of dry aging. But does that mean that if your processor does not impact the humidity, can you still have the same effect? Well, when it comes to the calpanes, yes, absolutely. Because the calpanes are going to work regardless of the environment. And then they'll stop working at a certain time. But then we then the flavor begins to intensify. Okay, so now you tell me, okay, Lida, that sounds great. But my processor can't, can't let my or won't let our beef hang longer than, I don't know, 10 days. Well, here's another option. As long as those cow pains are still working, right? They're still active. You can actually fabricate the carcasses and then let them sit in a vacuum package bag. Remember, the vacuum package bag is where we remove the oxygen. Uh, you have less than 1% oxygen left. As long as you don't freeze your products, the meat products, those cow pains will continue to work. And you can still intensify the flavor of the beef in a, in a bag, but the flavor will be different. Just know that um, dry aging and wet aging, there are two different um, processes here, uh, uh, but you can still achieve what you want to achieve. I actually had a processor call me last year, very upset um, with one of his customers who had sent him two or three head of cattle, but one of them happened to be a very young, young calf that came in, you know, with hardly any back fat. Well, the processor usually would let his his carcasses hang for about 10 days and when he when he saw that that young that young beef had hardly any back fat he decided to fabricate that young carcass and vacuum package it because he was afraid it was going to dry out well they the the owner the customer was very upset he wanted that you know the carcass to to hang for however long you know 10 or so days um, because he wanted to achieve that flavor. And so my recommendation was, well, if you haven't, if you've already vacuum packaged it, don't freeze it, leave it in the cooler and let it sit, right? Because the cow pains were still active. But once again, once you freeze that product and those cow pains stop. And just, uh, just an FYI, um, anybody allergic to penicillin needs to know that dry aged beef, like what you see there, meaning where we have the humidity set at a certain, at a certain percentage with temperature, um, that mold is a cousin to penicillin. I, I am allergic to penicillin. You will never see catch me eating dry aged beef because it's too much of a risk for me. Even though they trim, I'm not confident that a lot of it has been trimmed because of the roots of the mold. We don't know how far they go. And honestly, to me, it's not worth it. So just that's a freebie there for you. So when it comes to the considerations, though, of aging of, of meat products, we need to understand that even though we age them, it's not it's not going to solve all your problems because if you naturally have an animal that's naturally tough, right? That tenderness, those cow pains are only going to work so far. We have to also consider the age of the animal when it comes to, and then of course how they were handled when it comes to stress and so forth. Uh, know that the locomotive cuts, like anything from the shoulder, from the chuck, from the round leg they're naturally going to be tougher because of their function when the animal was alive. The more you use a muscle, the tougher it's going to be. Um, let's see. The other thing, and adding value, for those of you who sell your, your beef, have you considered maybe working with your processor or having your processor help you out here um, to assure that your the customers have a positive eating experience and recommend a certain degree of doneness? That could be helpful. Um, here is a slide just showing some basic temperatures of maybe, you know, recommend your product not be cooked more than 160 degrees Fahrenheit, because that can assure a positive eating experience. Because how many times do we eat something or use something and then we blame the brand or blame the processor or blame whatever when we overcooked the product, but we never 
thought about how we had um, we had an impact on that. When it comes to retail cuts, you know, there are just so many, so many retail cuts that we can cut. The, the main thing here is that we have to know what we have in front of us. And this is something that um, I've experienced the last three years, especially because of COVID. And with calls and emails, text messages that I've received with producers um, claiming that the, the processor has been stealing their meat, right? Uh, I worked a case um, in, in, in another state um, asking if I could investigate because this was going to go to court. And long story short, I, it turns out that um, the processor was unaware of what each animal brought to the table. And why this matters is because if you know that a beef animal will bring two whole briskets, when you get your product back, you should know that it should range between 10 to maybe 14 pounds. Again, it's it, it just dependent on the animal. They should not be coming in in two pound chunks. But if you don't know that a brisket, one whole brisket weighs so much and all, you're, all you have are two pounds, something's wrong. That means that we need to hold you accountable to, to understand this a little more. So we have to know what we have. We have two of everything except four skirts. We have two inside skirts and two outside skirts. And that that's where our four comes in. This is a, uh, a big thing for me here when it comes to body condition score and yields. Because an animal weighs 1,400 pounds does not mean you're going to get 1,400 pounds of meat product back. We have to understand, we go back to the dressing percentages and factors that impact dressing percentage. One, one of the basic uh, factors is body condition scores. You can see they range from a one to a nine. The one, two, two, and three would be considered more of your leaner, um, in theory, would be your less sellable product because more of that weight is coming from bone than, than muscle. If we look at your fours, fives, and sixes, they would be considered normal. Then you have seven, eight, and nines that are more um, that are exhibiting more back fat. Why does this matter? Well, here's here's something that we have to consider. We have to be able to see what's envision what's underneath the hide. A fourteen hundred two fourteen hundred pound uh, beef animals are not going to cut the same. Every animal is different, and a body condition score understanding how to evaluate and understanding body condition score is helpful because here's here's the deal here we have we have this um this specific breed where i you know just gauging or estimating i estimated this animal to be about a body condition score of a 6 more or less what i'm what i'm trying to to picture is okay body condition score of a 6 live weight of 1300 pounds how much of that is going to be contributing to percent sellable product and if you look at this guy who is about an eight, I mean, this guy is a is, is a pretty obese animal. This is what we have to we have to picture underneath that hide. How much of that is actually sellable? I don't know about um, all of our processors in Ohio, but at least here in, in in our meat lab, we don't get any money for fat. We don't get any money for bone. We lose money. And if a carcass comes in with this amount of fat, um, our meat lab has lost a significant amount of money. If we look at, you know, now we compare them side to side, let's just say that these animals were similar in age. Let's just say, well, the one on the left that's going to yield better is going to have a higher percent sellable product compared to the um, the one on the right that had more waste. This is where, where sometimes, at least the cases that I've worked, this is where um, some of the owners of these animals don't understand because they they may just think of that weight of like 1400 pounds or thinking good. I mean, that's 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 a lot of money for me, but it's it's a little more than that. So here we are in the middle meats or more on the sirloin side. You can see the big difference here. If we look at the middle meats and more on the rib side, um, there's just a significant amount of difference, right? Waste versus sellable product. And here is on, on our chuck side and our front side um, and just comparing. So body condition score is very, is very, very important in understanding how, 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 um, when, when is an animal truly finished? But then again, at what point, especially now when it comes to cold cows, okay, at what point do we decide to cull an animal? Here's a, here are two pictures that I wanted to show you that the carcasses of the cull cows that we worked with this past summer. The picture on the left, the carcass on the left, it was from a body condition score of a five, maybe a six. 
and the one on the right was a body condition score of a two. This is what we dealt with. When we're leaner doesn't always necessarily mean better. The picture on the right was was um, our actually our our smallest ribeye. This I mean I've seen lamb chops bigger than this. This was about roughly maybe about a good um, four point something square inch ribeye. Um, there's not much you can do with that other than just bone it out and grind it, right? Um, this is what the cold cows brought to the table in, in just looking at body condition scores of one to a six. And there there is variation. Uh, but what I do want to share with you also is I don't want you to, the take home message here is not that cold cows aren't beneficial and valuable. They are, they can be. As you can see, there are some some strip steaks in there that are nice and muscled and have some nice marbling too. That is very possible. But we also have to consider the age of the animal and there and there are ways that we can we can work with that. Um, the tenderness, there are categories. This goes back to understanding the function of that muscle. What was its what was its purpose when it was on that animal alive, right? Was it used a lot. If you look at the tough category, there you have a brisket. The brisket is going to be um, pretty lean for the most part, but you hope that there's enough marbling in there that is going to make up for some of that that toughness, right? Um, if you go to the tender side, here's where we have the tenderloin, as, as we all know, and then we have the flat iron. Uh, the gluteus medius would be more of your sirloin. Uh, your longissimus dorsi, that's your ribeye and that's your strip. Um, tricep to break your eyes, your shoulder clawed. And so just understanding, you know, one, again, going back to the function of the muscle matters. If you understand where it comes from, what it did or what it does, that could be very helpful. So again, in going back to addressing some of these and adding value to a carcass and improving carcass seals, um, I hope, you know, the, the information that was just shared is was was helpful and beneficial to help you answer your questions. Should I use cows and bulls? Yes, the short answer is yes. Um, but we have to remember though that um, when it comes to cows, we can still get some good value out of them and, and they can still marble very well and still produce um, some well muscled cuts. Uh, but we also have to take into account the age because naturally, they're going to be tougher. And so how do we combat that? How can we do this? The large scale industry, you know, the beef packers, they they use electrical stimulation to help them with tenderness. This is something that Benjamin Franklin uh, discovered back in 1770 something. Um, and it wasn't until 1970 that um, Texas A&M University began investigating electrical stimulation. What happens is, is that the electrical current that's applied to the carcass, right? Not the hide or anything, it's the carcass. What happens is that the electrical current disrupts the muscle fibers and it makes it more tender. So there, there are little things there that, that, that we can do, but the problem with electrical stimulation is that it's also a safety liability for our employees. Um, selling it, maybe some cows, uh, some cow uh, products and bull product as wholesale, right? Maybe some subprimals and cooked um, as a roast, cooking long and slow would be beneficial, things like that. But you also have to understand what your customers, what your customers are looking for. So with that, I will stop sharing. And uh, I forget how long I had Garth, but I estimated about 45 minutes to an hour for this. So I think I'm just right on time. Oh yeah, we got plenty of time. Good, good, good. Uh, a couple of questions that's come in. Uh, is tenderness associated with the degree of marbling and back fat? So if you look at the statistics, there is roughly a 20% um, twenty percent correlation to marbling and tenderness. I just gave a, a brief talk today to the American Farm Bureau, some, some sorry, some members from the American Farm Bureau and explained that Marbling, you know, there are some theories of marbling that our industry and our SMEAT scientists use, both density, lubrication effect, and um, insurance effect. So where marbling comes in with tenderness is if you if you picture, just here's an example. If I have a solid block of, of cheddar cheese and I have a, a block of Swiss cheese and I and that's the the cheese with the holes in it. If I cut samples of the same sample size and I gave them to you to, to chew and I asked you which one would be more tender, 
I would expect you to say the Swiss cheese was simply because of the gaps, the voids in that cheese, right? The holes. That's how we should we should see um, marbling. Marbling is less dense. Fat is less dense than protein. So more marbling means that the product, in theory, should be more tender. Um, for those of you who have tried Wagyu steaks, most times you don't need a knife to cut through it. You can actually use your knife to cut through it because of all that marbling, all that fat. You have a less dense product in front of you. So, um, so yeah, so marbling can help uh, tenderness. Now, as, as I tell my students, you know, uh, or anybody, if you want to impress someone and 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 assure that they have a positive eating experience, then prepare them a prime or a wagyu or even a top choice. But if you don't like this person and you don't ever want to see them again, well, cook them a select or a standard and cook it well done. You know, that'll assure that they don't have a positive eating experience. Another question that come in. Um, do we have any information on how people can learn cutting meat cutting skills? So short answer is yes. Um, I... I'm in the process of offering more workshops here soon. And I say soon, more like in the fall, maybe next next spring. Um, there's some money that that we're looking at receiving. So stay tuned. Or if, if you don't hear from me, my plan is to send this out through extension, send it out to as many people to start offering these work, um, meat cutting workshops. Uh, feel free to send me an email. Um, Garth can put my email in the chat. Uh, but yes, short answer is we're, we are in the, uh, planning stages of offering more meat cutting workshops. Dale is always welcome to join us. Any other questions? You know, I think Lida, one question that comes to mind, you know, a lot of times we talk about, especially on the beef side of things, quality, you know, as a quality grade, but a lot of our processors don't offer grading. Um, I guess the, the long and short of it is how can we help uh, producers explain meat quality without using those terms? So, I, you know, I've had several conversations with multiple processors. And, you know, when it comes to labeling claims, you know, if you haven't noticed, there are so many labeling claims out there and some very creative labeling claims that we've seen. You know, the one thing that I've, I, I've, I've tried to... Uh, to get some people to buy in is what if we created a label claim labeling claim that was something similar to our grades and but didn't require a um a USDA grader where maybe the processor like Dale could maybe have a, a branded program or a, a claim that said you know well marbled beef and that came with a certain uh value added price right or um good marbled or something along those lines to help to help describe. And that could maybe um, help our producers get a little bit more money and rewarded for producing these well marbled. Now, I would hate to use something like lacking marbling, right, as a labeling, but maybe that's just we don't add a labeling claim and we use it as a commodity and just say this is the standard price for this. Just to, I think it's something different. Yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah. There is a grading program that we're involved with now uh, with the cameras. I don't know if you've heard about that. And and we uh, we grade animals every week and it does. It's helpful. And that actually, Dale, and I'm glad you brought that up. I was visiting with someone from the Ohio Association of Meat Processors not too long ago. That actually could be our saving grace here in Ohio. Right. Buy in with that that app, that that program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's working well for us, you know. Good. That's good to hear. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have a question for you, if I can communicate this way. Uh, you were talking about aging and um, we're only letting our carcasses hang seven days. And, and that's from us economical standpoint i can double we used to hang 14 you know i mean and, and uh wouldn't make much money so i had to, i changed to seven so what i'm offering is if someone wants to age a beef 
We don't need to age the burger, do we? Or the parts that would be burger. What I'm offering is the short loins, uh, the ribeye and everything. We put them in the core and age them for however long they want. Mm -hmm. And am I right in saying that? Personally, yes, because if you just if you if you think about the base price of those middle meats compared to ground, they're they're significantly different already. And that's not even accounting for aging or anything like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I personally feel, especially for the sake of storage and space, that you don't need to. I mean, you could, but I don't think you're, the returns are not going to be what we'd want it to be if you did. Mm -hmm. with the so I think you're on the right track, in my opinion. Right. Yeah, it's just a. Uh... And we also, when you do that aging process, you are getting strength too, aren't you? I oh, mean, absolutely. Dehydration. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Right. You know, the large scale packing plants, they'll use showers. So they'll, they'll uh, shower the carcasses, um, you know, somewhere around like every, every two minutes, they will, they'll apply a cold shower for about 45 seconds to 60 seconds. Um, when it comes to, to carcass shrink, of course, now they only let theirs hang for 48 hours, but that's because they use electrical stimulation to account for that tenderness, right? But in within 48 hours, they found that when they didn't use the shower, the cold sh shower application, they had about a 2% shrink loss in that whole carcass. And you're probably thinking, well, that's not bad. That's pretty good. Well, when you're, when you're, when you're processing 6,000 a day, that adds up, right? So this yeah. cold shower... This cold shower also helped uh, reduce it from 2% to 1% shrink because you're going to have shrink. Uh, but for a 48-hour process or uh, time frame, they were perfectly fine with the 1%. Hmm. I'll be done. I'm getting ready to build a cooler, so I may add that shower system right uh, in there. Which, which, you know, I mean, and and we can talk about that because there are pros and cons to that. That works with the large scale, because remember, they only leave their carcasses in for 48 hours. Some even go 36 hours. I've seen some go even 24 hours, and that's more on the cow side. So mm -hmm. um, if you're if you're serious about it, I'm happy to I'm happy to work with you and talk to you about this. OK, no, thank you. Uh, we do leave uh, hogs. Uh, we kill on Monday. We cut on Tuesday. You know, just to get the body heat down to where, you know, where it needs to be and. And we aren't having any problems with that. What What's your take on that? Sorry, say that again. Someone just came into my office and distracted oh. me. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we we kill our hogs on Monday and and we uh, cut them on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Skin you know, on we or, skin, or skin off? Skin off. You're fine. As long as that internal temperature um, reaces 40, 45 degrees, whatever your yep, acid yep. plant says, you're you're perfectly fine yeah i've got a guy that walks around my plant that makes sure we got that and <laughs> my inspector <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right yeah a question uh in the chat um and i can touch on some of this but um you know a lot of our breed associations seed stock producers are putting marbling tenderness epds out um the question is how heritable are those epds uh for marbling and tenderness well um at least from my experience they are heritable i mean i mean it, they're strong and and there's a reason why people are using using these factors now in epds because we found that there's a strong correlation yeah, I mean, anytime we think about carcass traits, so long as the animal is on a positive plane of nutrition, correct, they're highly heritable. Correct. Um, so we can't discount the nutrition piece of that. Um, but if the nutrition's done right, carcass traits are some of the more highly heritable traits. Um, as far as EPDs uh, that are put out there, I mean, I've even seen where the Angus breeds putting certified Angus beef in the pedigrees, you know, putting the logo. You know, where that bull meets a threshold for a combination of traits that should get those cattle into the CAB so long as they're fed Correct. properly. Correct. Any other questions?
we come on the hour here. And, you know, and if there's anything that, you know, anyone has or comes up with later after this, you know, feel free to email me. Um, you know, this is what we're here for to help. And if I don't know the answer, we'll definitely find it for you. Uh, dot six two five. Is that correct? Uh, yes. I've got a few of those memorized. <laughs> then we'll hang on here for a few minutes. If like like I said, if anybody's got a question, feel free to type that in. Uh, we'll be back April eighteenth uh, with Dale. We've also got Lindsay Hall uh, with Maple Crest Meats and More. Um, Brad Barry doing some grass-fed beef there in Fairfield County. Uh, and then Christy Morrow, kind of uh, a new and beginning farmer dabbling in uh, direct-to-consumer meat sales. So we tried to find a variety of uh, operations, and they've probably got a variety of uh, things that have worked and things that don't in their experience. I'm sure Dale's got uh, some things if he wish he knew 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we'll... Uh, Pick their brains. If you have any questions that you want to uh, ask to that panel, we'll open up the Q&A box that night. Or you can go ahead and send those to me. My email is rough.72 at osu.edu. Um, so we're looking forward to hearing from those folks uh, April 18th.